Texas Lutheran University. Good morning. Welcome to today's sessions for the Crow's Symposium for 2014. My name is Annette Sitzler. I was on the planning committee, and I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker today. To those Texans who have been committed to environmental activism and advocacy for decades, Ken Kramer needs absolutely no introduction, for his reputation well precedes him. And that is just as one would expect for a TLU alumnus of his intellectual caliber and extremely strong work ethic. I am someone who's always been a little bit in awe of this man, maybe more than a little, for he was an extremely effective student leader here, graduating a couple of years before me. And as a fellow student, I hope that I could someday emulate at least a little of his success for I knew there would be a great deal of it. Happily, Dr. Kramer's success as a student on campus was just a small harbinger of his later record, which led him to a master's degree from Stephen F. Austin State and a PhD from Rice University. His career has culminated in a long and very distinguished career as the state director for the Lone Star chapter of the Sierra Club, from which he retired in 2012. His retirement, though, is far from idle, as he continues to serve as the state chapter's volunteer chairperson for water resources. Dr. Kramer's long engagement with water issues in the state of Texas, his editing of a recent book published by the Texas A&M University Press titled The Living Waters of Texas, and his outstanding commitment to clean water for all Texans including the hooping cranes and the oysters, as well as rice farmers and river tubing enthusiasts. All of these qualifications make him our number one choice to talk to you this morning about equity issues for Texas water. I'm happy to say that he's agreed to address questions at the conclusion of his remarks, and so we'll have microphones for you um, at that point to be able to engage with him in conversation. Please help me welcome to the podium Dr. Ken Kramer. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I sort of feel like I'm back in the days as a junior professor when I taught at Angelo State University and Texas A&M University, uh, holding down the initial morning slot for classes. Uh, I'm very impressed with those of you turning out uh, this morning at a relatively early hour on a college campus to uh, hear this presentation. Uh, I've spent um, well over 40 years uh, as a volunteer or as a professional uh, in working on environmental issues in Texas, uh, but the issue that has always been of the most interest to me and which has inspired the most passion in me is that of water resources. Uh, and although I'm biased in that respect, uh, I frankly think that water is the most challenging natural resource issue that we face in Texas. Uh, in the 21st century, uh, in part, of course, because Texas has a history of recurring droughts. Now, most of you in this room were not alive, of course, in the 1950s when we had what was known as the historic drought of record, uh, the worst multi-year drought in Texas recorded history. Uh, but most of you were around uh, in 2011 uh, which was the worst uh, single 12-month period of drought in recorded Texas history. Uh, but what is oftentimes, I think, even more interesting is the fact that those recorded droughts are, are only reoccurrences of droughts that we've had in the past, even before recorded history. Uh, Todd Botler, who works for the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority, based here in Seguin, has done research to show that uh, through tree ring, uh, studies, we've had droughts in Texas of great severity, uh, even more so than the drought of record of the 1950s in uh, times before we had recorded 
uh, our rainfall every year. Uh, and so recurring droughts is something that Texas faces. Uh, and as many of you know, because of climate change, uh, about which some of you heard last night from Dr. Bullard, uh, the prediction is that Texas is be going to become a hotter and drier region than it already is. So water is going to not only be a challenge for this generation, but for many future generations in Texas. And our challenge is intensified by the growing population of our state, which is expected to grow by at least 80% over the next 50 years. Uh, that means more people, more demands for water, uh, other things being equal, uh, and we have to decide how we are going to provide for the water that that population needs in a relatively hot and dry climate. Uh, so how we address those challenges in terms of providing a clean water supply raise a number of environmental, social, economic implications and a number of equity issues. And by equity, I simply mean fairness and justice. Are we going to provide water to all segments of our population in a fair and just way? Or will we be basically subsidizing some segments of our population to provide water at the expense of others, or at least at a cost that is going to be borne by all parts of our population? And I think this gets to the general concept of environmental justice, uh, because environmental justice is a concept that questions whether or not certain segments of the population are benefiting at the expense of others. Our challenge in Texas is going to be to provide water to meet basic human needs without necessarily benefiting one segment of the population at the expense of the other. Now, let me sort of narrow things down today to say that I'm going to be focusing on uh, the issue of providing an adequate water supply in Texas. Uh, there are many other aspects of water, like water quality, water pollution, uh, which are certainly uh, major topics of discussion. But because we have limited time today, I'm going to focus on the supply issue. How are people like you and I going to be able to have clean and affordable water to drink uh, and to use for other purposes uh, in the decades to come? Uh, even more narrowly, I'm going to focus on what those of us in the water policy arena call municipal water supply. Uh, and that's a very simple concept. It means basically the water that you and I drink every day that we use to brush our teeth, uh, to take a shower, uh, to water our shrubs or lawns if we have outdoor landscaping, uh, and to wash our cars or trucks, and to do those everyday things that we depend upon water as a resource. Um, so municipal water supply, when I talk about that, is basically water that's supplied to residential customers, people living in single family homes or multi-residential uh, unit uh, buildings like an apartment, uh, or commercial enterprises like businesses, uh, let's say like a restaurant, uh, or institutions like the university, or a hospital, uh, or a prison. Those are all part of the municipal water supply, municipal water users. Uh, so I'm focused today on how are we going to meet our municipal water demands in Texas? Really, how are we meeting them now and how are we going to meet them in the future? And what are the implications of uh, how we actually go about doing that? So in examining these questions, um, I'm going to put forward uh, an assertion that there are at least three significant equity issues in how we address providing that future municipal water supply. I'm not necessarily saying these are the only equity issues uh, revolving around water today. There are many such issues. But these are ones that we're actually seeing played out on a daily basis in Texas now and will become, I think, more prevalent in the future. Uh, and how we actually deal with these equity issues will say a lot about us as a state, as a community, as a culture. So let me lay them out now, and then I'll go back over each one of them in more detail to let you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the first equity issue revolves around the fact that our municipal water systems, by and large, 
are structured to meet what are known as peak water demands. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and those peak demands uh, come from certain segments of our society, especially what we would call high-end water users, people who use a lot of water. Uh, that has implications for how we size our municipal water systems, how much money it costs to provide that water, uh, and who pays for the water that is provided. So that is one major equity issue. And in discussing that, we'll try to make a distinction between what I call demands for water and actual needs for water, which may be much less than what we demand in terms of water resources. A second equity issue uh, is the fact that the cost of providing the water infrastructure to meet those demands is accelerated by population growth, which, of course, continues into the future based upon at least what the trends have been. But the initial cost of meeting those additional water supply demands of future populations are borne by existing water customers. And so to some extent, there's an unfair burden on those of us existing now to pay the initial cost of providing water that's going to be used for future generations. And that is implications for the price of water and what it actually means in terms of how much we pay on a monthly basis for water. A third equity issue is that increasingly, urban water demands by the big cities like San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, El Paso, um, and other cities of smaller size, uh, those urban water demands are being met, are being proposed to be met by water supplies that are being brought from rural areas uh, to the urban centers uh, for the urban population. And that has enormous implications uh, potentially many negative implications and consequences for the economies, the environment, and the society in rural areas, and sometimes negative implications for the uh, private property rights of landowners in those rural areas. So those are the three equity issues concerning water that I want to explore today. The issue of peak demands and what the implications are for who bears the cost of meeting those peak demands, the issue of addressing the growth of population uh, and the initial cost of, of doing that on existing customers, and then the implications of this rural to urban water shift, which has uh, a lot of consequences for those people living in rural areas, as well as the environment of those rural areas. Now, before I go on each one of those points, uh, a few uh, sort of significant facts about water, uh, about municipal water especially, I need to provide to you because many of you are probably not that familiar with this topic. Uh, one particular aspect of water that you need to know is that historically in Texas, water itself has been a free natural resource. Uh, the cost of water in terms of what say you as a water customer in San Antonio or Seguin or somewhere else uh, has to pay to actually get that water has traditionally been the cost of the infrastructure to get that water to you, to develop the water supply in the first place and then get it to you. So what I'm saying is that it's not the water that's say in this glass, the actual substance itself, that has had a cost assigned to it in the past, uh, traditionally, it's been the amount of money that a water utility had to spend to build a surface water reservoir, let's say like Lake McQueenie, uh, or to dig a groundwater well and pump from the Edwards Aquifer, uh, pipe that water to a certain area, perhaps treat the water uh, to drinking water standards, and then distribute that water to your homes or your offices or whatever. That's where the cost of the water has come from that infrastructure traditionally, not the water, the substance itself. In Texas, we have uh, surface water rights that are allocated by the state and a potential water right uh, holder can apply for that water right 
uh, and get it from the state. There are certain fees involved, but basically they're not paying for that state water. Uh, if you are a landowner, you've been able to dig a well uh, to provide for the water being pumped up from under your land. Uh, you're not actually paying for the water, you're paying for the pump uh, and all the equipment to then distribute that water to your house. But things are changing. And because water is becoming scarcer in terms of most of it has been allocated one way or the other, the vast majority of it, it means that now water is not necessarily free. The substance itself is not necessarily free. Now people who have water rights, either groundwater or surface water, uh, through water markets are able to actually sell that water. So the cost of water is now becoming not just the infrastructure, but the cost of the actual substance itself or more. Now, it's still the case there may be an opportunity for drilling a well uh, or getting a surface water right. Um, so essentially the water is free. It's just in the cost of the infrastructure. But that is less and less of the situation now because so much of the water has been allocated. Uh, a second fact you need to know, and this is somewhat my personal opinion, but I think it's borne out by other water professionals in Texas and elsewhere, is that in Texas and in the United States in general, the actual price of water that most of us pay, the cost of water in that respect, is relatively low and does not really reflect the true value of that water. And in part it's because the water has, the substance has been free in the past. In part it's because politicians are loath to raise water rates, that's a very, un, uh, uh, for a politician, it's very unenviable to have to raise any kind of rate, much less a water rate. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, we pay very little for water in terms of municipal water supply. Uh, in Austin, for example, uh, last month, which was the highest water use month for my wife and I in Austin, where we live, uh, we used 3,400 gallons of water that month, which is a relatively small amount. Uh, for the first 2,000 gallons, we paid $1.84 for, uh, for each 1,000 gallons of those 2,000 gallons. Now, how many of you go to this convenience store and buy a bottle of water? Any of you buy a bottle of water? How much does a bottle of water cost at a convenience store? A dollar or two, probably. So basically, for that same amount of money to buy one bottle of water uh, in Austin, my wife and I are able to buy 1,000 gallons of water. Well, that's cheap. Uh, it also shows you why uh, companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi like to sell bottled water, because they can make a lot of money off of bottled water. Uh, but the point here is that for most of us, actually buying water on a monthly basis through our water utility is cheap. Uh, and so some of the things I'm going to say about the cost of water and the burdens of bearing that cost of water uh, may seem a little contradictory to you because in essence, I don't think water is really priced at the level that it probably should be. But the question is, even if that is the case, uh, how is the ex existing cost of water shared by various segments of the population? Where is the equity in that? Uh, another important fact is that when we talk about water infrastructure necessary uh, for cities like San Antonio and others uh, to provide water to you, uh, we're talking about what is usually considered a capital expenditure, a big amount of money that has to be spent for a water treatment plant, a reservoir, a groundwater well, uh, some type of treatment plant, pipeline distribution, uh, and these <laughs> high cost are usually uh, financed through what's called the bond market uh, by a municipality or a water district where they actually issue bonds to investors who purchase those bonds and then in return the investors are paid back over a period of time out of the water revenues of the utility uh, for the investment they made plus interest. It's the same as getting a loan and indeed we do have mechanisms in Texas whereby a water utility can go to what's known as the Texas Water Development Board, a state agency, and get a loan uh, for 20, 30 years 
to finance a capital expenditure uh, to add to, create, or expand uh, their water treatment system. Uh, so that's important. So basically, that's how we finance water in Texas, at least traditionally, that's how it's been done. But now more and more, we're seeing uh, private companies come in with opportunities to sell water to utility. Uh, and so in some cases, this financing system has been changed. And in more instances, we're going to see uh, utilities probably making deals with private companies to buy water. And that means that the costs are going to be a little more immediate in many respects and not necessarily spread out over a very long period of time. Uh, but one thing in terms of a final point here is that even if a water utility is financing its water system through the bond market, through loans, and paying that back over a period of time, the ultimate cost of that water is borne by the ratepayers. The water is not free in that context. You as a ratepayer in Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, or wherever, are going to be paying for the cost of that water infrastructure and for the financing of that infrastructure. So it all ultimately comes back to our pocketbooks as to where the expenditure for that water comes from. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. All right, so those are sort of the background facts uh, to discuss some of the equity issues that I'd like to discuss with you. So the first equity issue, again, is that our municipal water systems are, by and large, structured to address what are known as peak water demands. And these are often demands that reflect uh, the high-end users uh, of water uh, at a cost, though, that is borne by all of us who are part of that water system. Uh, so traditionally, a water utility has sized their infrastructure to meet what are known as peak demands, to provide what is sometimes termed peak capacity. Uh, that means delivering the volume of water necessary to meet the demands of all the users uh, at the most, uh, at, in Texas, probably the hottest time of the year. Uh, and that's in part because in Texas, in the summer months, that's when people uh, engage in a lot more outdoor irrigation of their lawns, their shrubbery, and even their trees. Because in the heat of the summer, uh, you may have less rainfall, and therefore you're going to, from your perspective, need to maintain your landscapes. Now that peak demand can be substantially more than the normal amount of water that is used throughout the rest of the year. Uh, let me give you an example in Austin, where I live. Uh, this example is from about 10 years ago, uh, for reasons I'll explain later. But it does illustrate what is a common finding in Texas water utilities. Uh, in Austin, in 2006, the residents of Austin used about 110 million gallons of water a day on an average basis throughout the entire year. 110 million gallons a day on average throughout the year. But in the summer months, Austin residents averaged about 180 million gallons of water a day because of the demands for water during the summer. But the peak water day demand in Austin, the one day where the residents of Austin used the most water during the summer, that usage was 250 million gallons for that day. So in other words, 140 million gallons more than the average for the entire year. And that again reflects that at certain times of the year in the summer, you're going to have a heavy demand for water for outdoor landscaping. And this is not unusual in Austin. Uh, it's reflected elsewhere throughout the state. Utilities in Texas have historically seen uh, water use uh, between the summer and the winter jump by 1.5 to two or more times the volume that you have during the winter months. Uh, and sort of illustrated by my own situation, uh, this past winter, our average monthly water usage in Austin for my wife and I was 2,000 gallons a month. 
August was our highest water use of the year. It was the one month in which we actually put water on our lawn, the only month in which we've done it, uh, and it was 3,400 gallons. So that's you know, about 1.4 times what we used during the winter. So outdoor landscaping is the biggest single user of residential water or municipal water uh, in terms of most water systems in Texas. It uses from anywhere to 46% to 62% of the water uh, used by municipal systems each year. And that percentage varies depending on which study you look at, what particular cities you're looking at, uh, what type of year it's been, a drought year, non-drought year, lots of variables. But by and large, the main thing, as you can say, is that roughly half of our annual municipal water usage in Texas is putting water on our lawns and our shrubbery, outdoor irrigation. Uh, now what that means is that basically our water systems are structured to meet that peak demand that's caused by outdoor irrigation. But as you might expect, that tends to basically be because of the demands of the higher end users, the higher socioeconomic segments of our society. The people who have large lawns, extensive shrubbery. You don't find a lot of people in low socioeconomic status that have big lawns or extensive shrubbery. Uh, that's not part of their existence. It's not something they can afford to do. So to some extent, when we're talking about meeting peak demands, we're talking about meeting the demands of the highest end water users in the cities around the state. Now let me give you an example. And this is an extreme example, but it illustrates the point. Uh, some of you may be from San Antonio. You may uh, know that the San Antonio Express News, uh, the local newspaper, uh, every year publishes um, a list of the top water users, residential water users in San Antonio. Uh, and it's always very enlightening to see this. Uh, in the most recent one, in uh, the spring of this year, uh, the Express News reported that in 2013, uh, in the seven month period from May through November, one residential customer in Texas, uh, excuse me, in San Antonio, uh, who happens to be an heiress to a construction uh, fortune, used 1.8 million gallons of water at her home and estate. That translates to 250,000 or so gallons of water per month between May and November of 2013. Now, go back and think my water usage uh, in the winter months in Austin was 2,000 gallons. I have a single family lot. Uh, and the peak was 3,400. Well, her peak was 250,000 gallons a month on average during the summer months. And when questioned about this, she said that she had done some things to cut back on her water usage, but still in December of 2013 and uh, January 2014, her usage was 190,000 gallons each month. 190,000 gallons is 25 times the volume of water that the average San Antonio residential customer uses, which is slightly less than 8,000 gallons per month. Uh, now that is an extreme example, but it does illustrate the point. Uh, if you look at the entirety of the Express News article, you'll see that the top 20 residential water users in San Antonio all used over 800,000 gallons during that seven month period between May and November. So that's an incredible amount of water. Now it is true that those people who use more water because of San Antonio's tiered water rates are paying more in an absolute sense. Um, in terms of the highest water usage that I was talking about, depending upon various things, she was probably paying somewhere between 600 to about $1,200 uh, per month for her water bill. Uh, whereas the average San Antonian would be probably less than 10, I'm sorry, the lower users would be less than 10. But in San Antonio, the way the water rates are structured, uh, the highest tier, is for anybody who uses basically more than 17,000 gallons of water a month. Well, there's a big jump between 17,000 and 190,000 or 250,000 per month. 
So it's still the case that the majority of water users are to some extent subsidizing, if you will, the highest end users. And the structure of the system is directed at providing the peak demand that the high end users are seeking. And I would say again, there is a difference between the demand for water and the need for water. Does this person who is using 1.8 million gallons of water, primarily for outdoor landscaping, actually need that water? Is this a basic human need to provide that water? Not in my opinion. And so what we're talking about is meeting demands and not necessarily meeting needs. And that means that the cost of the water goes up as a result. So that's one equity issue. Are we basically structuring our water systems to meet peak water demands, which basically will benefit a certain segment of society, but at a cost that is borne by all of us? Now, there are ways of dealing with that on an equity basis by trying to shave that demand or manage that demand. I'll address that uh, to some extent at the conclusion of my talk. So the second equity issue is the cost of providing water infrastructure to meet these demands is accelerated by population growth, which will continue over a period of time based upon the trends that we've seen. But Basically, the cost of the new infrastructure is initially going to be borne by the existing customers of that water utility, and that's another equity issue. Basically, those of us who are alive today who are already paying uh, water rates to a water utility, uh, if we foresee a major population expansion that the utility thinks is going to require a major expansion of infrastructure, that means initially those costs are going to be borne by us. We're going to see our water rates increase to pay for that growth. Now, I understand that growth has a lot of positive implications uh, from the perspective of many people in terms of the economy and the society, but we have to understand that population growth also brings with it certain cost. It's not just a total gain. There might be a net gain or a net loss. It depends upon a lot of things. So traditionally, we've said the price of water has been based upon the cost of infrastructure, but because water has been allocated so heavily in the state, we see now that the cost of water is not just the infrastructure, but more and more it's becoming the cost of selling or buying the actual substance itself. Uh, in the past, um, and let me say, the cost figures for trying to say how much a new water supply cost are sort of all over the board. And it depends a lot upon the specific circumstances involved with a particular utility, a particular region, a particular type of water supply. So it's hard to make generalizations. Uh, but I can say that, say, 20 years ago, uh, the city of Dallas, Dallas Water Utilities, could develop a new water reservoir, surface water reservoir, something like Lake McQueenie, uh, for example, uh, and they could do it for a cost of about $200 or less an acre foot. An acre foot of water is a term of measurement that those of us in the policy uh, arena of water use a lot. It's simply uh, the amount of water that it would take to flood one acre of land to a depth of one foot. That's what an acre foot means. It's roughly 326,000 gallons. But when you're talking about large volumes of water, it's a little easier to talk in terms of acre foot than gallons. Um, Dallas Water Utilities could do a surface water reservoir for about $200 an acre foot, say 20 or 30 years ago. Well, today, Dallas Water Utilities is trying to determine what are the infrastructure projects we're going to do in the next 50 years uh, to meet our water demands. And they are seeing potential prices of five to $600 an acre foot for a surface water reservoir, which may or may not be possible to build for a variety of reasons. Uh, they're seeing costs like $1,000 or more for what's known as a desalination plant, where you take seawater or brackish groundwater, extract the salt to provide usable drinking water. 
that carries with it energy cost for that process as well as the cost of disposing of what's left over, the salt and the other constituents. So it's becoming more and more expensive when we're talking about water infrastructure alone. But if you're also talking about potentially having to buy the water itself and not just build the infrastructure, it's going to become even more expensive. Now, some of you may have seen, because it's been in the news this week in the San Antonio news media, uh, the controversy over the proposed San Antonio water system pipeline uh, that would actually be a private company, uh, where they would basically be paying a private company, the San Antonio water system would be paying a private company to bring about 50,000 acre feet of water each year, potentially, uh, by pipeline from a groundwater aquifer in Burleson County, which is Caldwell area near Bryan College Station. Uh, that 50,000 acre feet of water would be brought each year uh, to San Antonio at a cost of what is estimated right now to be $2,200 per acre foot as compared to what we are talking about in Dallas a few years ago or a few decades ago where it was $200 an acre foot. San Antonio Water System says that that will increase water rates for San Antonio water customers. The entire price tag of the project, including the infrastructure and the cost of buying the water, is $3.4 billion. Uh, and so that's a huge expense. Now, the water system says it will only result in a maximum water rate increase of 16%. Other people are disputing that that is going to be the maximum. They think it's going to be higher. But the point is that this water is being provided, or I should say San Antonio Water System is seeking to provide this water. The final approval has not been given by the San Antonio City Council yet, uh, to provide for the population growth. <coughs> but in reality, this goes back to the peak demand issue. San Antonio Water System has said that they not only want this water to provide for anticipated population growth, but they want to have a sufficient amount of water to avoid the San Antonio area ever going into what they call stage three or four of their drought contingency plan. Now, if you're not familiar with the drought contingency plan, uh, that is a plan that's required of most water utilities in Texas today. Uh, so that they have a way of addressing situations where rainfall uh, is basically going to be, or the state's going to be, their area's going to be in a drought situation. Uh, and so they have developed these drought contingency plans that usually have stages. Stage one is often just voluntary where they ask people to cut back on their water use uh, because of a drought. In, in San Antonio's uh, situation, stage two, uh, their drought contingency plan is limiting people to watering their outdoor landscape only once a week. Uh, and then in stage three, it's only once every other week. <coughs> Excuse me. So right now, San Antonio is in stage two of their drought. It's based upon their Edwards Aquifer levels. Uh, what the business community in San Antonio has been saying the past few months is that we don't ever want San Antonio to have to go to stage three of their drought contingency plan where people can only water their lawns once every other week. In fact, one business leader is purported to have said during this discussion that people won't move to San Antonio if they can't have green lawns. Apparently, that is the major reason why people would not move to San Antonio, because they couldn't have a green lawn. Uh, in that respect, then, uh, they say, we must have water to provide for uh, those people who want that kind of outdoor landscaping. So that is, a, that is an issue in terms of equity. We are basically asking people now, potentially in San Antonio, uh, to provide water to meet not just growing population, but also to meet the demands of those high-end users so that they can still water their lawn at least once a week. Well, that to me is an equity issue. Why should I have to pay a disproportionate share, a higher cost for my water to ha actually subsidize the, those high-end users? 
So the final equity issue is that increasingly, urban water demands are being met or proposed to be met by water coming from rural areas. Uh, the San Antonio project is a perfect example of that. Uh, you have 50,000 acre feet of water potentially per year coming from a rural area. The local groundwater district in that area has uh, already issued a permit to this private company to pump actually more than 50,000 acre feet of water. But there's actually studies that indicate that pumping 50,000 acre feet or more, or I should say more than 50,000 acre feet a year from this particular aquifer, uh, means that basically you're going to be pumping water out of storage in the aquifer. Uh, it's not just going to be basically keeping the aquifer at a sustainable level where to oversimplify things, the water that you take out is being replenished by recharge through rainfall and percolation into the ground. And so potentially you're denying that rural area a water supply that otherwise has been available to them in the past. Uh, there's another example in the Dallas and Northeast Texas area where Dallas, I'm sorry, not Dallas itself, but uh, a water district in the Dallas-Fort Worth area is proposing to build a reservoir in Northeast Texas that would flood 70,000 acres of prime timber, agricultural land, and wildlife habitat, uh, potentially really devastating the timber economy of that area to provide water for Dallas, which has historically been a hot water user. So these are the kinds of issues of equity that we're facing in Texas today in terms of providing an adequate water supply for our population now and into the future. Uh, there are ways of addressing these equity issues. And frankly, the first way of addressing the equity issue is to focus on demand management. And that means trying to shave those peak demands, which is part of what Austin has done in recent years. Austin has, through various watering restrictions and things like that, shaved off their peak demand. So they've never reached that 250 million gallon a day peak demand that they had back in the middle part of the last decade. San Antonio has had great success in terms of water conservation. Uh, they basically, for a period of 20 to 25 years, saw a population growth of 67 percent but during that period of time, they were pumping no more water each year than they did at the beginning of that 20, 25 year cycle because of their conservation programs. Uh, and you see that across the state where utilities have done conservation and efficiency, they've been able to shave off those peaks or they've had good drought management and contingency plans, they've been able to shave off those peaks and avoid or at least postpone uh, new water infrastructure projects which have high cost. There are a variety of other ways that we can address this issue, but conservation efficiency is the first priority, the first place to go if we want to really strive for an equitable system of providing for the actual water needs of our population as opposed to the water demands. So I've given you really a snapshot of some of the issues involved in providing for municipal water supply in Texas today. Uh, one of the problems I have as a speaker is that I've been working on water issues for 40 years as a volunteer professional on a variety of water issues and it's hard to know what to focus on because there's so many complex water issues facing our state. But let me assure you that those of you that are looking in terms of your future potential careers and topics or issues to deal with, if you're going to be in Texas for the rest of your life, I think there's no more important issue for you either as a citizen or professional uh, to focus on and potentially look at as something that might be part of your career than how the state is going to deal with the water resources challenges that we face down in the future. This is probably the key natural resource issue that's going to determine uh, how our state evolves and how we progress over the next 50 years. And especially with the impacts of climate change, it's going to be even more challenging than it would otherwise be. Uh, but in Texas, we've always had those recurring droughts, which makes it a challenge regardless of that. So I hope that all of you will take this to heart. It doesn't mean that all of you have to get involved in water issues, but 
I would certainly welcome and relish more involvement by citizens in water in Texas because it really is the key to our future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. We have time for a couple of questions. There are microphones in both aisles. Um, I would ask that you uh, limit comments and please direct questions uh, to Dr. Kramer so that uh, more of us get an opportunity to interact with him. We only have about five minutes, so we'll just take um, the three questions that are here. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Dr. Kramer. Good morning. Um, my question has two parts to it. Um, one thing that we as students notice or are very aware of is how frequently we notice the sprinkler systems running on campus. And I was wondering if you would be able to estimate how much that costs the university every month. Um, and also, if there is anything that we as students can do on a daily basis to be more responsible with our water. Great question. I actually parked in the back parking lot this morning and walked the sidewalk around the building to the entrance to Jackson Auditorium and noticed that all the sidewalks were wet. Uh, and uh, I had a similar experience when I taught at Angela State uh, back in the late 70s where we had a university president who really liked to water the lawns in San Angelo, which was 200 miles west of San, uh, excuse me, Austin, where the rainfall is only 12 inches a year. Um, and uh, I don't know about the cost. I don't know exactly, to tell you the truth, I don't know whether Texas Lutheran gets its water from the city of Seguin or whether you have your own well or what the source of that water is. Uh, so it's hard for me to estimate the cost of it. But I do think that it would be important to investigate how much the university does spend on watering the lawns and the outdoor shrubbery uh, and whether or not they can cut back on it. Because one of the things that a lot of people don't understand you know, a lot of us talk uh, disparagingly about St. Augustine grass and things like that because it's a heavy water user. Uh, but even if you have something like a St. Augustine grass lawn or some other um, turf grass, uh, most of the time actually people water it more than it needs to in order to actually sustain itself. So I, I would just urge you maybe as a student to ask the university, uh, where's our water coming from? How much is it costing us to irrigate? Are there ways we can cut back and how much water could we save? Now, in terms of your individual activities, it's sort of hard to say. If you live in a dormitory and all that, uh, you probably don't have a heavy use of water. Uh, if you live in a single family dwelling, uh, then there are more opportunities for you to cut back. One of the things that uh, we've done in Austin is um, we capture, I mean, this sounds pretty simple and pretty basic, but my wife actually is, um, very committed to capturing the water from our shower that would otherwise just go down the drain by just putting a plastic bucket in our shower, capturing the water, and then at the end of a shower, taking that water and putting on the plants outside rather than going out and turning on the hose to water those plants. Uh, there are actually a number of websites. San Antonio Water System has a good website with water conservation tips you can go to to find out how you individually can help in that regard. So I would encourage you to look at those things because there's a lot of information out there. Yes, sir. Is it feasible to channel some of the water, fresh water, from the Mississippi River across to, say, the Texas Hill Country and build a dam and a reservoir there? provide a water supply, fresh water, for Austin, San Antonio, and other areas here? Would it be economically feasible, and would it be possible to channel some of that water that goes otherwise fresh water into the Gulf of Mexico and the oceans, which doesn't need more water, so to speak, and use it uh, to provide water for all purposes in this area? Well, it's a good question. The question has come up before. Now, I would uh, take uh, difference with your predicate that that fresh water going into the Gulf is not needed uh, because the fresh water is needed in the coastal bays and estuaries to mix with the saline water to create the proper environment uh, for the nurturing of like shrimp, nurseries, oysters, etc. Uh, so you have to be very careful about cutting off too much fresh water to those estuarine areas. Uh, that proposal was actually made back in the 1960s and presented to the Texas voters who voted it down. Uh, one of the issues, of course, is that even if Texas thinks it's, 
it's, we have the manifest destiny to take water from the Mississippi River. Miss, Mississippi and Louisiana may not look at it the same way. They may not see us as being the people who need that water. Uh, I think the big issue right now, setting aside all the environmental issues, is cost. The energy cost of pumping that water would be astronomical. Uh, and so most of the studies I've seen about importation of water by long distances, the energy costs are the killers in terms of uh, you'd be pumping the water basically uphill, if you will, to the hill country or to the panhandle as it had originally been proposed. So uh, I don't think it's financially feasible. I think there are other ways we can address our water issue that have less cost, both uh, economic and environmental. One final question. Thank you. Do you think imposing a water tax for incoming residents will be reasonable or rational uh, so that um, existing residents don't have such, so much of a burden? Uh, I think that is a, a good question and a good possibility. In actuality, in some jurisdictions, and San Antonio is one, uh, they have what are known as impact fees, uh, which are uh, fees paid by developers for developing new subdivisions, et cetera, that have to have water service. Uh, the problem from the perspective of the utility is that usually those impact fees never really cover the entire cost of that additional development. They simply sort of ameliorate some of the cost of it. Um, and, you know, to some extent there's always an outcry from developers when you try to impose higher impact fees because they say they're going to reflect that in the cost uh, and price of housing. Uh, but I think it is a legitimate way of addressing the equity issue to try to recover as much of the cost of development from those impact fees as possible. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. Thank you, audience, for your questions. Um, will you be available I'll for be, a few minutes? I'll be around. For so if you want to meet with him individually and engage with him, I think that he would welcome that. Please help me in thanking him one last time for his remarks. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.